If we could just release the standard body geography function assignments and agree that intelligence lies in the gut. In fact, most things that define person lay there. Emotions, movement, memory, the building blocks of both our own and new life. Wrap your arms around the navel. Here lay your foundation. Now do the same with the earth, an equatorial belt defined by the Tropic of Capricorn and Cancer. This planetary sash is made of you, Tamarind, originally and aptly named the Tree of Life in your Sudanese homeland. You quickly circumnavigated the tropics. The ingredient that adds instinctual depth to dal, reincarnate memory to Vietnamese Nak Mang Mi sauce, the hip sway to agua fresca, your tangy earthbound pulp, a portal to biological brilliance, a love most of us have without even knowing it. I love you. I'm Jessamine Starr. You're listening to Fruit Love Letters. Food for me is a way to express love. I'm a chef in Atlanta, and I fold my feelings into the meals I cook. For my family, my friends, even strangers. It can be hard for me to say, I love you, but you will know it when I serve you roasted golden beets with black sesame and ginger dressing. But if I peel you an apple, slice you a persimmon, pick you a mulberry with my stained fingers, then we'll both know it's really serious. Fruit, of course, have long been considered symbols of love, even aphrodisiacs. On this show, I'm exploring our love of fruit and what it says about us, people. On this episode... Tamarind. The word tamarind likely comes from Tamar Hindi, which means Indian dates in Arabic, but the tree is native to equatorial Africa. There are a couple different kinds of tamarind. One is sweet, one is sour, but it's actually a monotypic fruit. That means there's only one species of it. Incredibly, despite that, It's cooked in wildly varying methods to punch up vastly different dishes, primarily by people living around the equator. So I wanted to talk to a few different chefs to hear how they incorporated this fruit in their dishes. I turned to chefs working in my little part of the world, the American South. The South is hot, humid, sticky. Tamarind, though not native, fits right in here. And as the South's immigrant population grows, the taste of tamarind will become more common, as vital as other Southern favorites like barbecue or sweet tea. I hope, anyway. Okay, so the first chef I spoke with. My name is Sam Four. I am the chef owner of Tuk Tuk Sri Lankan Bites, based in Lexington, Kentucky. And I do pop-up Sri Lankan Southern dinners all over the country. Is it only Sri Lankan food, or is it kind of a mashup of Sri Lankan and Southern food? I like to think of it as an amalgamation of the two because it's both where I was raised and where I'm from. And oddly enough, the two work perfectly well together. Tell me a little bit about your background. How did you get into cooking? I was born in Kentucky, raised in North Carolina. My parents came over here in the early 70s. There was a very large influx of South Asian immigrants in the medical professions in the early 70s because those visas were very widely available. So you would have these small cultural pockets of Sri Lankan families that would kind of make do because it's not like you come to Ohio with all the same ingredients in 1972, 73 that you would have in a kitchen in Sri Lanka. Moreover, it's when the class divide kind of started to show and servants weren't cooking as much as families began to cook. And so there was this huge schism of knowledge because you'd have the people who were okay enough to come over here with 50 bucks or or what have you, but then they would have no reference for their own food. You know, there's no way to get super fresh fish easily unless you're on the coast. 
So the food, like the immigrants' new environment, began to change while still retaining its cultural ties. Everyone started to eat chicken. You know, people are living off of lentils. People are living off of everything that's familiar. Some auntie smuggles over curry leaf tree and decides that she can find tamarind paste or find tamarind pods and boils them off and keeps them in her kitchen in a little jar to add some depth and dimension to her dishes. But that's how we learn how to cook. It's not just repetition or or a brigade system or whatever. It is straight up exposure to familial recipes and familial traditions and cultural traditions. And for a lot of the first generation American kids like myself, we were all encouraged to go into various and sundry professional realms. Not a lot of us started cooking. I was always cooking on the side and then it eventually became my full-time gig. So today we're talking about tamarinds. Do you have any tamarind memories or what was the first time you started to realize that it was a good ingredient to use? I mean, your first taste of tamarind when you don't know what you're expecting is a little bit jarring. It is the slightest bit of sweet with some really punchy, overpowering sour, which I like now, but as a child was not my favorite thing. But you see it all over that sort of equatorial region between tamarind candy and various and sundry marinade sauces that are used in Latin America to going into Asia, South Asia, where we use it as a souring agent, sometimes even as a preservation agent. And you can also see it used in, you know, desserts and such. It has so many versatile uses that I think it's kind of like a, it it is a secret weapon in my kitchen because I use it for everything from pork to onions to making the cutest, sweetest little fruity tamarind amalgamation that is set to wow. It has so many unexpected, like joyful moments in it, if you will. So in your cooking, give me some examples how you use tamarind. So the most common example of me using tamarind has been in sini sambal onions, tamarind onions. I use them on everything. I love to have them with coconut milk rice and just put a dollop on top. Or lately it's been my grilled cheese go-to because you just don't expect that brightness, that acidity, that crunch of an onion with that tamarind glaze. It changes the sandwich's identity completely. People will find more ways to combine balsamic and honey before they'll reach for the tamarind concentrate. And it's such a versatile and useful ingredient. It imparts sourness and sweetness to the pork dishes I make. I use it with jackfruit to make it mimic big, bold flavors. I use it for my sini sambal to just accent every condiment I have. And by cooking out just a little bit of the sourness, that sweetness just intensifies just a little bit. So it creates just so much more depth for your bite. And I like to think of my quest in cuisine between both Sri Lankan and Southern as kind of this quest for a perfect bite. What really piqued my interest is the CD sambal. I want to hear more about that. And jackfruit, cooking tamarind and jackfruit. So tell me more. So with sini sambal, you take some curry leaves, some chilies and some onions and you'll cook them down until they're nice and soft. But then as they're starting to soften and take on, you know, everything else around it, all the flavors in the oil, you introduce a good dollop of tamarind. And as that cooks down, as that slowly, slow, slow, low cooking, caramelized onions, like, I mean, almost studenty caramelized onions to the point that you're caramelizing for like an hour but it has this beautiful, sticky, spicy, amazing taste and texture. With tamarind, it almost kind of takes on this sort of, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking of Ghostbusters. (laughs) 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 It has its own sort of... Ectoplasm. It bands together really well. Yeah. (laughs) And so it becomes its own thing. So you can put it on everything from, you know, your rice and curries to a plain piece of roti, I still put it on toast in the mornings because I just think it's a good way to start the morning. You can also put it in your biggest meats, your biggest flavors, and it's strong enough to stand up for it. For my jackfruit curry, I actually prepare it almost the same as a pork curry, except sans any of the meat or animal byproducts, because the texture of young jackfruit really mimics that super, super well. So if I put in a curry powder blend that I do with some toasted cumin, some toasted coriander, a little bit of fennel, curry leaves, some cinnamon, cardamom, blend all that up, throw in some black pepper and throw in just a good squeeze of tamarind and let it marinate into my meat. 
Sam says Tamarin can also act as a bit of a tenderizer. So you get a whole load of benefits from just introducing it for just a couple of hours. And there aren't a lot of ingredients that have that kind of versatility and utility to their like general uses. But when you throw it in with a really fatty meat, it cuts through that fat and really amps up the meat flavor and the spices as best as I can think of it. It becomes a, a whole journey because of the tenderizing aspect too. If you're not clear on it yet, Sam uses tamarind in a million different ways to achieve a million different effects in her food. It is the furthest thing from a one-note ingredient. It just adds a whole spectrum of color. The next chef I spoke with is Parnas Savang. He recently opened a restaurant called The Lot Market, not too far from my house. The first time I went there, I recognized the familiar-to-me Thai flavors, but it was like no other Thai food I'd ever eaten. It was so fresh, with such depth of flavor. I asked him how he got started. Well, I grew up in a Thai restaurant in the outskirts of Atlanta, in this town called Lawrenceville. My mom and dad served like Thai American food for that community. I didn't really enjoy working there when I was a kid, but I think as I grew up, I grew more of an appreciation for it as I went into the food business more. I went to Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park for two years, and then I came back down to Atlanta, worked at Empire State South, Kimball House, Staple House. And then along this journey, I always wanted to eat really good Thai food, but it was never represented in Atlanta the way that I wanted to eat it. So I decided after working for other people that I was going to open my own idea, my own business. I had a dream of a restaurant, but it would take many more years before that happened. So he started a pop-up. I was just happy to have my own kitchen, be my own boss. And my friend Rod Lasseter joined me a couple weeks later and We were just having fun and making food, and then we got all this national recognition, and I got a James Beard nomination in 2018 for Rising Star Chef, and I got all these other awards, and I didn't feel like I was even ready yet, but the world wanted those flavors as I wanted those flavors in the city. And then we just opened a restaurant last year during the pandemic, and now that we are doing dine-in after all the to-go boxes that we've gone through. We've really built a foundation in the beginning that has become better and better. And we're understanding more of our food, Thai food, more these days. And it's delicious. In some ways, the food he makes is recognizable to someone whose only knowledge of Thai food is from eating in American Thai restaurants like the ones his parents operated. But there's also something vastly different about it. He says it comes from trying to create flavors that his family might eat at home that would be more recognizable to Thai people. I feel like most of my upbringing and observations of Thai people and food was just eating things that you have to work for it to enjoy it. That's what I've noticed a lot with eating fish with bones in or duck with bones in and then tamarind, sweet tamarind. They just crack it and you just kind of gnaw on it and spit out the fibrous parts and the seeds. Parnas has followed in this tradition of working hard to enjoy his food. We do a lot of things from scratch that most Thai restaurants wouldn't do, like coconut cream and milk or curry paste, to name a few. I was obsessed with fresh coconut cream and milk for a very long time. And even during the pop-up, We would buy coconuts, brown coconuts, and grind the meat out from the shells and hand press it ourselves until our hands were aching after a couple months. But that's why we've upgraded and we have a hydraulic press now to aid in that endeavor of fresh coconut cream. And finding dishes that you wouldn't find anywhere else in Thai restaurants, and that gets me excited to explore those, and that's what makes my food different from everybody else. He also uses fresh ingredients from local farmers at Thalat Market. He learned to source his produce during his time working at other Atlanta restaurants. 
Working at Kimball House and all those other restaurants made me appreciate the local farmers in Atlanta. And like, I didn't know for a while that that existed in this town. So I got to see all this amazing produce come in. And I try to find creative ways to incorporate that into the Thai flavors that I do know. So this episode, we're talking about tamarind. And I feel like it's a ingredient that so many people in the equatorial region use. It's such a common thing that gets slid in, but that so many people don't realize it's in there. And it's also really an important ingredient. You know when a dish is missing it, but you don't know what it's missing. So how do you use tamarind? There's two types of tamarinds that we use. There's the sweet kind and the sour kind. But we usually use the sour version to add a certain acidity to the dishes that require it that traditionally you would find in Thailand. For example, the papaya salad, the som tam has tamarind in it. It's just like a splash. It's not the star. It supports the other acid that's in there, which is the lime juice. There's tomatoes in that salad, so there's a little more acidity there. And then there's masaman. It's more of a Muslim-style-influenced curry. has a lot of spices compared to other curries in the Thai curry repertoire. Will you walk me through a little bit of how you make your masaman? Yes. Because I think it's pretty special. So we need these three things. We need the curry paste. We need the coconut milk slash cream. And then we need the vegetables and protein that goes into this dish. So with the curry paste, we grill all of our shallots, the garlic, the galangal, the chilies. And then we add a bunch of spices like mace, nutmeg, cinnamon, also called cassia bark, cardamom seeds, clove, coriander, cumin. Masaman is the most labor-intensive curry. They add the scratch-made coconut cream slash milk, the potato, some sort of onion, braised chicken or beef. And then we go to the seasoning, which is fish sauce, palm sugar, and tamarind. So it comes in at the end, kind of. Yes. Tamarind is a sourness that when you cook it, it doesn't fade. Like lime, it fades. But with tamarind, the acidity stays the same. We don't introduce that at all in the the beginning, but at the end, we finish it with tamarind. It's very subtle. It's not like this is a tamarind curry. There are other curries that do use tamarind as like the forefront. I don't remember what it is, but I remember there was a recipe that called for tamarind leaves. Oh, I didn't realize that you could eat the tamarind leaves. Yeah, it's almost like sorrel. It's like sour, but it still has that tamarind note in a green form. And then some people finish soups with it, almost like putting herbs in a soup. And then there is the immature, unripe tamarind, the green one. Uh I've bought it once and I didn't know what to do with it. There's like relishes that people make in Thailand with that. He says one thing about cooking Thai food the way he does is that he can't always get the ingredients he wants, at least not to the standards he keeps. Mango is an example. In some cases, it limits what he can put on the menu, but it also keeps his produce and his dishes fresh and flavorful. As a result, what he serves is thoroughly Thai, yet tied to the place where he cooks, Atlanta. Still, he says, what's available is always changing as local growers and importers respond to the demands of changing demographics. He says increasingly once hard-to-find produce is becoming available locally, and that includes tamarind products. I can't wait to see, like, tamarind leaves and green tamarind and more tamarind products in, like, Bigfoot Highway Farmer's Market or DeKalb. And I can't wait to see what he makes with them. The next chef I talked to is Maricela Vega. I am from Atlanta and I run a business called Chico. What our main focus is mixed to mall products. So we make everything from tortillas, 
Tamales is what I'm most known for. We also make sopes, lacoyos, tostadas. Basically anything with masa is going to be our forte. And as I mentioned, we're based here in Atlanta and we plan to sort of be distributing these goods throughout the regional Southeast. My influences stem from my family who in Guanajuato, Mexico, dedicated themselves to growing milpa, peanuts and garbanzos amongst other crops in the southern volcanic portion of Guanajuato. Guanajuato is in central Mexico, straddling the drier country to the north and the lusher climates to the south. It's known for its agriculture. The best way that I can describe it is we're on an old volcanic basin, which means that there's so many gorgeous hills that just spill into a lagoon that you can see. It's called Lake Huitzel. And Lake Huitzel is at the border of Michoacán and Guanajuato. So where we are, you're washing dishes and you just sort of see this like gorgeous blue sky and then like the river and the lakes. And of course, you have the hills and the agriculture that are just sort of surrounding that. So our hues are often blue and green there. It's just a beautiful region, I think. Like Parnas Savan, who's also in Atlanta, and Sam Four, Maricela likes to explore what the produce farmers in her region can supply for her business. She blends locally available ingredients with Mexican ones to make her rich flavors. A very unique piece about Chico is that while we do work with a lot of small co-ops that are stemmed in Mexico in various states, we also work with a lot of farm partners in state as well as any states surrounding Georgia. So we incorporate our roots along with how we were raised here in the South. So there's a big intersection of that, even in things like camotes, Something that we always have growing up, which is sweet potatoes, but it's a big crop here in the South as well. So one of our big fillings and sauces is actually made with sweet potato. And then peppers, we will get dried peppers. We do get dried peppers, but we also work with whatever peppers are available here in the South. And sometimes that's ají limones, often, of course, jalapenos. And then, of course, there's tamarind. It's not grown around here but sometimes she can find fresh tamarind at the local market, and sometimes not. I don't use it enough, and I think it's just because even sometimes at the cab, it, it's sold out. I was looking for it two weeks ago, and I couldn't find it. Do you always use the pods? Do you ever use the paste? I usually like to use the pods, and I like to get both the two kinds that they offer at the decab market. Because there's a sweet kind and then a tart kind, right? Yeah, so I like both and just playing with the different levels to manipulate whatever it is that I'm making. But yeah, I think it's like a great way to get acid sometimes if you're not wanting to use even lemon or lime or apple cider vinegar. And I just love to cook with acidity, so that's sort of why I really respect it. Would you share a recipe for how you've been using it lately? Presently especially because beet season's about to be happening. And I feel like beets are around two times a year. I was sitting on an excess amount of beets and just trying to figure out how I could make a salsa in that first cold frost. So struggling with like, man, what, what can we do? Well, I roasted a bunch of beets. Here's like a quick recipe. You could probably take about a pound of beets, roast them up, just like in the oven, either salt roasted, or maybe with a little bit of water and some spices. And then I blended that up with just like a saline solution of guajillo peppers. And in that saline solution, I separated some of that salt water to kind of steep the pod. And that's how I found is the easiest way to remove it. And I guess this just sort of explains why tamarindo is so often considered subtle because it it's kind of hard to eat it off of the pod. And while you can, and I have, it's easiest to just extract it. So that's what I do is I soften up that pod and then I basically am left with this water and I just try to clear it up with the shell as much as possible. And I take that sort of paste and I blend it with the guajillo, maybe some confit garlic and some raw garlic, as well as probably like a half an onion, blend that up. I probably have some toasted cloves, black pepper, coriander and cumin, 
And next thing I knew, I had a really tasty salsa. All this talk of salsas and tamales got me daydreaming about my favorite Mexican treat, mango nadas. Often, they come with this straw. But it is a straw that has tamarind paste, a really thick paste mixed with sugar and chili. So it's sweet, it's salty, it's spicy, it's chewy, and it is delicious. And when served in a mango nada, which is essentially a mango smoothie, it goes so good with the cold, sweet drink. We used to just buy the straws and the candy and gnaw at them. And that was our very unhealthy way of having tamarindo. And that was, ah, pupa something, I think. There's a specific little brand that is like a, I don't know. Are they the little balls? They have the little balls, but then there's like a little strip, kind of like a fruit roll-up or something of tamarindo as well. My other favorite way of having tamarindo is in ponches. So the ponches are traditionally served during the holidays when they start to do the posadas. So it's just like the X amount of nights of Christmas or something like that. But basically you make this ponche and they can typically have like tecojotes. They're fruits from a hawthorn tree, a Mexican hawthorn tree. The hawthorn is native to Mexico and makes a fruit that looks like apples, but very small. It's usually yellow or orange and tastes bittersweet. So you put tecojotes in. I think they're usually dried. Also raisins, sugar cane, guayabas, and then tamarind pods, apples, citrus. Everybody has kind of like their own recipe, but you generally do see tamarind, guayaba, and tecojotes, as well as a sugar cane. You kind of let that cook for about an hour on low And if you want, you can spike it, but we never really spiked it. It was just so good on its own. And it's just like a fruit punch. And you get a little bit of everything. And so you have the sugar cane too, to kind of like gnaw at. And yeah, you're just sort of gnawing at all the fruits and also sipping this hot, almost tea in a way. And it's very delicious to kind of have the different profiles The tamarindo will hit you too in the sourness and then you'll get chased by the guayaba as well. And then meanwhile, you're gnawing at the sugar cane. So it's just like pop, pop, pop. (laughs) Yeah. So you could see why, okay, I love the candy, but I do love the ponche as well. Three chefs with three different backgrounds and very different ways of using tamarind. I wanted to talk to dozens of more chefs from places where tamarind is a staple. From Central and South America, other parts of Asia and the Indian subcontinent, as well as the fruit's original home in equatorial Africa. Next time, I hope. Meanwhile, I wanted to share a personal favorite way of using tamarind. Inspired by the spicy, sweet, and sometimes salty tamarind treats of Mexico, I love to make tamarind cayenne honey. You simply Mix a spoon of tamarind paste and a dash of cayenne into your honey of choice. And if you're feeling adventurous, a dash of soy sauce or miso, you can store this indefinitely in the fridge and drizzle over fruit or toast. But it is excellent on buttered cornbread, roasted sweet potatoes, grilled salmon, or fried egg. You can even add a bit to sauteed bitter greens like kale or mustard greens. That's it for this episode. Thanks to our guests, Sam Four, Parnas Savang, and Maricela Vega. You can subscribe to Fruit Love Letters anywhere you get your podcasts. And we'll be back next week with more Love Letters to Fruit. Fruit Love Letters is part of Whetstone Radio Collective. Thank you to the Fruit Love Letters team, producer Irina Zhorov, audio editor Bethany Sands, researcher Carolyn Crosby, and intern Indigo Clarkson. 
I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfeld, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer Celine Glazier, sound engineer Max Kodolchek, associate producer Quentin LeBeau, and sound intern Simon Lavender. I'm Jessamine Starr. Thanks for listening to Fruit Love Letters. You can learn more about this podcast at whetstoneradio.com, at Instagram and Twitter at Whetstone Radio. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, Whetstone Radio Collective, for more podcast video content. You can learn more about all things happening at Whetstone at whetstonemedia.com.